Hello, and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is longtime friend and colleague, Miles Eldreth, college professor and senior manager at TransUnion. He has a surprising blend of superpowers. By day, he's a government contracts and compliance expert, and by night, he teaches business, finance, economics, international affairs, management, and accounting. He's a podcaster, a career coach, and an avid gardener. He's also one of the most astute observers of current events that I've ever known. You've heard of futurists. Miles is the consummate nowist. Miles, it is awesome to have you on the podcast today. I've never heard the word nowist until you said that, and I like that. <laughs> you know, it made me laugh because it was kind of close to Maoist. I was like, I'm not that. <laughs> but um, the, yeah, the, uh, the pleasure is mine. And congrats on a little over a year you've been doing this, which is crazy because I looked at the episode list. I was listening to your back catalog and I'm like, okay. wow, it's been a year. A year. Yeah. Turn around and yeah, it just goes by. You. It does. It does. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, totally. Thank Happy to be here. Thank you. The reason why I wanted to have you on is that the, the world is going through a, a hard time right now. And I'm hoping that by sharing some of the experiences that you've had and observances that you've had uh, in mm -hmm. dealing with some of your own recent challenges, um, that it would help me and our audience to navigate through tough times as elegantly as I feel that you have. So. Tell me a little bit about the, the last few years and, and some of the challenges that you've faced and observed. I'll start with <clears throat> myself versus observations. One of the uh, beauties of being a teacher, as long as I have, if you, especially in the Northern Virginia area, is you, you get everyone from everywhere. And I've seen and heard some experienced through my students some very tragic and but in my personal life you know I lost both my parents in a very short period of time to uh to cancer and uh it was rough you know because you you know I was I was the always the person with the old dad anyway my dad was 48 when I was born so everybody thought he was my grandpa even though he didn't look that way you know he didn't really look old until he got sick when you're younger you look at your parents you don't see old you see you know, they're still kind of young and my dad was always older, but I could tell when he got sick, like his hair went white and, you know, and all this other stuff, he slowed down. He couldn't fix stuff like he was always doing. Yeah. And I didn't like watching that. I definitely didn't. And then my mother uh, who died last, uh, last year, not even a little older than over that, I was intensely involved in that. I took care of her for the last four years of her life, you know, in and out of chemo treatments and just uh, one of the worst things about that was sitting in the room, you know, where, you, they have, where you're getting chemo and just sitting with her and looking around the room and seeing someone my age in the, one of those chairs. Mm. And of course, it's like, and, and that's happened. I have a coworker, actually, he's 42 years old and found out he had uh, colon cancer or something. And wow. it gives you perspective. And I, I struggle greatly with this. And if you're talking about challenges, it's like, all right, this, you would think this would force you to focus. Yeah. Well, it did for a bit. And then COVID happened and all this other crazy stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, the politics mm -hmm. stuff that we talk about constantly, they're absolute nonsense, you know, <laughs> and, you know, the other thing with your parents is I'm an adult you know, I have a career and a family. I'm not like destitute or anything, but your parents are the only people on the earth aside from maybe your, your significant other that is always, they're always there for you without question, whether right. they complain about it, like my mom did. Mm. the last thing I remember, you know, that was with her is I got sick and I had to go to the hospital right before she found all the tumors in her brain and being as sick as she was, she was still sitting right there with me, you know? Yeah. So I'm like, yeah. Um, uh, as far as students, other things I've seen, like I told you this, I had a lady who was a first generation immigrant from Syria mm. and um, she, she wore a hijab, but, she I could tell she had some scars or something going on and you know I was like I don't know how to empathetically ask about this but she just was an open book you know she was talking about how uh, during the war the conflicts she 
had her house burned down and her family in front of her and, you know, all this other stuff by soldiers or rebels or whatever. I don't remember which side it was that who, it doesn't really matter, honestly, if you think about it. Yeah. And I'm sitting here, I'm like, wow, what an amazing person you are. And you're here. I don't know how you got here, but good for you. <laughs> and you're, um, you're, you're positive and you're functioning and you're, you're just, you know, I'm just amazed by people like this. Yeah. I have such, I have students that are, that are so far on the spectrum that, you know, as far as autism Asperger's, I'm, I'm, I'm at the, uh, let's say high functioning side of that where I can still talk and do things, but I see them and, and the struggles they go through as well. And just the very people with various disabilities that kind of just get pushed through our system. And I'm like, good for you. You know, it gives me context too, because right. there's people that have never met their parents. You know, there's like my wife who's adopted, you know, luckily is adopted by wonderful people, but, mm. um, but yeah, we had, I had some career bumps and things happen and some things not work out the way I wanted to, but you know, it, it ends up sounding like complaining after a while, but you kind of have to take the good with the bad in this case. But again, my students, when I talk to them, I'm just like, all right, they just inspire me because I'm like, you're still, you're still going, or especially these students that are like our age and they come back and they're, they're all apprehensive because everybody else in the class is 20 and they're 50 something or whatever it is. And I'm like, ah. yeah, I had an older uh, Vietnamese man in my class, last class. And I'm like, good for you, man. Cause he's just like, I'm tired of doing what I'm doing for my career, I'm going to go do something else and just decide it, yeah. you know? How do we get through hard times? Well, if I were to say this is a one, two, three process here, and this is stuff that I'll just, I'm very, very personally, I struggle with these things. Mm -hmm. Realize there are things you, you cannot control. Right. Actually, a lot of things, a lot. Most things, honestly, <laughs> what you can control in your, in, your, in your sphere of influence is very little. Yeah. And it's not about controlling. In many cases, it's kind of just like, all right, well, that, that happened or that's going to happen. What's the next step? Like I've been on LinkedIn, you know, LinkedIn has this whole looking for work thing. Now you can put on your profile, mm -hmm. you know, that, and I've read so many stories of people that hopefully they really are true where they're talking about being rejected there's a lady that was talking about getting to like the end of a job interview where she never made it to the hiring manager but she had three or four interviews before that wow and there's companies now that are are uh there's there used to be ghosting on the comp on the side of the other folks and now there's ghosting on the company side mm -hmm. so you can't control any of that you can't you know i i have a six-year-old and as you know with kids you they do all sorts of things that are ridiculous. And I'm realizing I just can't control that either. It is what it is. So number two, minimize negative information. Uh, in my case, that's getting rid of most social media. Mm -hmm. I hate to say it. Mm -hmm. I feel like the older I get, the more excuse I have for that. Cause I'm just like, eh. aside from right. professional things, I'm like, why, why am I on, why am I looking at Twitter? Like why, why, why would I, care about Instagram or, or Snapchat, especially or any of this stuff, you know, right. Facebook, even barely, you know, mm -hmm. I'm just, um, the problem is, yeah, you can control what you see, but then you, you just put yourself on a bubble anyway of, 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 uh, echo chambery stuff that you agree with or the like cat videos or whatever makes you happy. You know, I keep telling right. Christine that because she'll be like, did you see right. this thing on Facebook or my wife? And I'm like, no, I didn't. Cause I don't look at it because it's, I don't need the stress. Right, right. You know, um, maximize positive positives. Again, I have a history of uh, bipolar disorder in my family, massive mm -hmm. negativity, depression, all these other things that are negatives. And I do my best to be positive and maximize positives. Mm -hmm. You can't always do that. Mark, I think you're excellent at that. At least, you know, I'm, str and I'm sure you struggle internally, but externally you present a very positive image, like, you know, which... I've seen more and more people struggle with that, mm. you know, and, and I had a lady at work that I've never heard complain about anything, but she went off the other day about how busy she was and how much help she needed and been at the company 47 years, 47 years. So she is a encyclopedia of stuff, credit and whatever else. She's a grandma. So one of the nicest ladies I've ever met, but she was like, cause that the, when they were foisting, agile on us in other cases mm -hmm. she was like i do not have the bandwidth for this i do not 
I love, it sounds interesting. And she was t- asking one of her employees if he could handle it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then it was just like, whoa, but now that just kind of brought things in there to where everybody's kind of struggling and we all need to look at more positives and then be present. Mm-hmm. I am so bad with that. I am forcing mentally. I think Simon Sinek was talking about how when he goes out with friends, they only bring one phone, you know, and that's usually just to take pictures of food yeah. or something yeah. like that. <laughs> so they can actually have a conversation. It was good. I don't know how truthful he is with that because we're all just stuck with these things, but I've been trying so hard to be present, mm. to be here. My crazy brain won't let me do that sometimes, but at the same time, that's it's hard to be a nowist and not know what's going on, but being present kind of removes the whole nowist thing a little bit because the now right now is not super positive. Mm. Um, mm. And the last thing is exercise your mind, body, all of those, and psyche and read. Yeah. I mean, read as much as you can. I read constantly. And mm-hmm. um, from every type of organization, I read real stuff. I read fantasy. I read whatever, um, just random random things that interest me. But it, it's always something, you know, that, that mm-hmm. I'm like, hey, this sounds interesting. And then I end up getting into it. But, yeah, and I think, you know, exercising is important, getting outside, especially working at home. I mean, yeah. my God. Right. Because like, our jobs, I don't know, there's been a lot of, uh, I just read an article on LinkedIn, speaking of reading about all the babysitting software they've ramped up because everybody's working at home, mm-hmm. stuff that can sense your heat, whether you're sitting there or not. And I'm like, all right, all right. So you want us to have a balance, but you don't. So mm-hmm. we, the companies are just as culpable in this. Yeah. You know? So what purpose does difficulty, pain, suffering challenges what purpose do they serve um it's all part of life honestly Mm. like i feel like i hate to criticize certain things but and i I i'm not including my young folks in this or my students but i feel like part of the reason there's strife in some cases is because we're going through actually a real period of suffering that a lot of young folks just never really experienced in many cases, we didn't either. The way we grew up in the 80s, 90s, it's right. a pretty great time to grow up, you know? Yeah. But our, our grandparents and our parents remember real suffering. They remember food shortages and depressions and mm-hmm. constant wars that they had to be drafted into, you know? And now we've got a real crisis. Um, whether it, it's manufactured or not, people keep telling me this, and I'm like, all right, I'm not going to get into crazy conspiracy theory. Just deal with what's in front of you and Maybe that's true or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was something I've been trying to instill in my, my daughter. You know, she just wants to say things are too hard and just quit, which unfortunately I always liked to when I was younger. Yeah. So it's like, despite me wanting to help her, I try not to. And then that frustrates me because I want to help her, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah. like, I feel like I'm too harsh sometimes, but I kind of counterbalance my wife when she just waits till she gets really frustrated at me. I'm just like, nope, stop that right now you know, but you know, I feel like I'm too harsh, but it's a reminder to myself to keep working harder for her sake and mine, Mm -hmm. you know, and I, am always like, where's, where's the line with the pain, difficulty and suffering that I impart. And same as an instructor, it's like, you have due dates, you have late grades, you have all this. And it's like, how flexible are you? Right. You know, cause there's no real standard in in higher education of that stuff. It's all subjective based on the teacher Mm -hmm. in many cases. Sure. And I'm pretty clear on my requirements, but most of the time I'm like with my students, I'm like, just communicate. If you don't tell me what's going on, I cannot help you. Mm -hmm. But if you're forthright with me, you know, you only get so many dead grandpas or whatever, but, um, right. (laughs) And cause I'm like, um, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to make up something, you got to make up, but either way, the, I'm okay with working with anybody about this. It's the same at work we all have deadlines, we all have issues. And I don't know what people are going through, you know, and I'm always very cognizant of that with somebody takes some extra time to get me a thing. And they're like, Oh, I'm so sorry. It's late. Or I'm sorry. I sent you the wrong information. And I'm like, it's totally fine. You know, (laughs) Mm. you got it to me eventually, you know, like asking some of the stuff I have to ask for is very complicated because some of the stuff the businesses work on is extremely complicated. Right. 
and you have to talk through it. And of course, sales wants an answer like, you know, right now, but that's not possible always. So I, I get it from my end. And I'm always like very aware of other people, whatever's going on. Is there good in suffering? Of course. Hmm. Of course there is. But I think suffering can be manufactured in some cases. Hmm. It's like when you say somebody's a hypochondriac. Um, right. or, or I know this because part of being uh, dishonest with yourself and with others, you, you, you know, you surround yourself with this idea that something is always wrong and you're always going to need help or whatever it is. Cause it feels good to be taken care of. Right. Yeah. But you yeah. can't, part of suffering is letting go of that safety blanket in a way. And my parents were that in many cases, you know, my mom, especially my dad was old school, silent generation so he, he mm -hmm. wasn't the most emotional i think our dads were very similar <laughs> in yeah. that sense hard working you know they loved you they didn't really say it a whole lot but that's right. okay you know whereas my mother was very much involved and very constantly asking me if i'm okay about every little thing like uh recently i did something stupid where i dropped the power drill on my foot you know mm -hmm. of all things on my toe and um it's okay, you know, but it's, it hurt quite a bit and I had to deal with it and all sorts of crazy nonsense. Yeah. And the first thing that popped in my head is if, oh God, I can't tell my mom. And then I was like, I can't tell my mom. Mm. So, wow, you know, because if I did, she'd constantly bother me about how my foot's doing or whatever. And then I thought about that and then I ended this sad spiral and I was like, all right, all right, get out of it, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get out of your brain, get out of this idea, enter into, you know, but then the thing I'm probably, I'm going to be like that with Claire. That's just how it is, mm -hmm. you know, cause I'm, it's built into me. But again, is if you, other thing is asking for help. I am terrible yeah. at this. Most people are terrible at this. I have to push so many of my students to be like, what do you need help with? You don't understand a question. I will go through it a hundred times until you do, you know, cause I think, and again, because they've had some negative experience with somebody where they did ask for help and that person did not offer or was like, just figure it out. Right. You know, and that's, again, the line with kids is like, where do you do that? Or where do you help? Or, you know, something like that. So, uh, don't be too proud. I, I'm the fixer person, man. I'm the one, I'm the teacher. I'm the one that fixes your problems that answers stuff yeah. that, sorry, cat. <laughs> that, uh, and I, I, you know, you have to learn how to help yourself if you are that type of person. And it's very, very hard. Yeah, yeah. What do you think we learn as a result of the challenges we go through? Patience. I'm going to say patience a lot. Because mm. being patient and uh, listening to um, others is much more important than talking a lot. And part of suffering is suffering with other people. Understanding what they're going through because it gives you context. But, you know, I can't imagine, I've had a couple people I know that have lost children, yeah. you know, not necessarily to COVID or other things, but I don't know, patience, perseverance, and a real sense of self. Because yeah. when you're younger, you spend an entire, you spend most of your time with an idealized version of yourself. And when you get older, you meet your real self. And that real <laughs> self has all these flaws and weird right. ticks and you know, it's hard to own your, the, the, the suffering and just mistakes and things that you're, you're not good yeah. at. Right. Yeah. It's like yeah. tag teaming. If you're married, you know, you've been married a long time like me and you have to tag team things with your spouse. I need to get better at that. You know, I'm used to just, all right, I'm going to take charge. I'm going to take this over. And it's like, that's not how you can't I mean some things, but for the most part, it's gotta be a tag team. Right. right. Um, but learning from suffering, man, that's, it's like a constant process. Mm -hmm. you know and empathy is the big part of it there's all these discussions going on nationally about stuff and it's like mm -hmm. even if you're predisposed to have a certain opinion about what somebody else's opinion is based on you know, what you think how they how you think they're going to present stuff right right you should still yeah. listen first before it, you blurt things out of your mouth you know um 
So it's like, it's really easy to read news and be like, oh God, this person, that person, you don't even know that person. And until you know that person and you've dug in to whatever they're suffering through or whatever, you can't, you cannot honestly form any opinions. And if you are, you're just being dishonest or whatever, right? So that's the way I look at life. You're, you're a blank canvas, right? And, and I don't care about the rest of the externalities. You paint it in with your discussions with me, your, your background, your whatever. And if I don't know any of that, then I'm making zero assumptions about you. You know, zero. Because I want to know you. I don't care about any of the other stuff. And you, the you is interesting to me. The, 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 uh, the externalities and the other stuff is just, you know, is not necessary to even uh, consider at first until you know the you of that person. Right, right. One of the things that impresses me about you is that you've gone through a lot uh, lately, especially in the last few years, yet you seem to absorb it and move forward. How do you do that? I don't, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. I mean, I move forward regardless. It's more of just a stubbornness that was put into me by my parent, my mother mostly of, you know, I got stuff to deal with, deal with it. And then deal, yeah. sometimes deal with the emotions after the fact. And that's not really the way you want to, you want to um, uh, operate in life. Unfortunately, there is a very real medical condition called broken hearted disease. And I, I there's like Toga Subo something or other. I can't remember what the actual phrase is. Yeah. And I was, I felt I was very acutely suffering from that, you know, mm-hmm. at some point last year. And then, cause it's funny. Cause when I lost my dad, it was a shock. And we lost our dad right around the same time, which is really weird, man. Yeah. Like yeah. I was the interesting when we met and I was like, it's just something we connected over, unfortunately. Yeah. But it wasn't, as much of a, I'm going to say I mi- I missed him and, and, you know, I had, but when I lost my mom, it was like, I lost both my parents all over again, mm. you know? And it was a, I just, we had built this space for her in my house and she was, yeah. her and I were finally in a good place relationship wise. And, you know, she was happy to, st- and then just, you know, all of a sudden, and I struggled for months and months and months. I, can, I will recommend, you know, some form of therapy for folks if, if they need it. I should have probably done more. I should probably do more. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just now somewhat feeling normal after moving, losing my mom last year, basically acting as a caretaker, that being my entire identity. I'm rediscovering myself. You have to rediscover yourself. You are not the you you were before that whatever tragedy happened. I'm a different person. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, I am, I'm not. That person is gone that me, the miles, that tight whole identity that was tied into, you know, Northern Virginia in many cases was my whole life where I grew up out there and all my family is gone. My grandmother moved out, everybody. So one thing I've done too is just, I had to stay away from certain things that triggered all these emotions all the time, Mm -hmm. you know, recently unpacked and I found a book. My mom started writing that she didn't even tell me about. It was a grandma book. Uh-huh. And it was for my daughter. And it uh-huh. was like all these thoughts, like she, she, it was very, very much her, you know, very blunt and very to the point, but there was a whole section about what she thought about my dad when she met him and what her, my parents, what my grandparents thought, which was what he was too old. <laughs> oh. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they changed their mind about that. But, um, and then <clears throat> just some very, unfortunately prophetic things that my mom you know, as, as, uh, as negative as she could be, there's some things that have come about that she was very astute at paying attention to. And that's where I get the nowest from. Yeah. People don't want to deal in reality, man. They don't. Yeah. Uh, trust me. That's part of the reason I still play video games occasionally or whatever is to get my brain out of this crazy world, the stuff that's going on. Right. But you kind of have to, and you have to be prepared. Mm-hmm. So it's like on top of COVID, everything else is, is enough to drive anybody insane the political circus and I've just tried to focus on staying busy and my family. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're paramount. And I felt like my family suffered, you know, the past few years because I was focused on taking care of my mother, Mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, it's a process. And, and it's like, there's a, there's an incubus song called new skin. And I think that's very accurate 
you know, to what's what's talking about is the you that comes out at the end. The other side of it is not the same you. Mm. It's just not. How important is personal responsibility in getting through hard times? Paramount. Mm. If you don't take responsibility for your situation, including things you cannot control, it will eat you alive. You know, mm. there you, it will. Because even the micro decisions are still decisions. I don't know what that is. It's like I heard the term. I was introduced to the term microaggression years ago, and I, I don't like that term very much. But, <laughs> I've heard um, it. yeah, I would say micro decisions, like little things, like just little behavioral ticks and stuff like that, that you can change. That you're just, you know, you, and they start piling up. And and when you go through, you know, a tragedy or whatever it is, like a real tragedy those things become very apparent because they build this like monster of wall you have to push down. Mm. You know, it's my, my, what my vice is like, you know, I don't eat a lot of food, but I tend to eat bad food and other stuff. And I've had, I have to remove myself from that situation. I can't have certain food in the house. I can't be around things or, you know, it's just like, I, it's, I treat it like I'm a drug addict with certain mm. things, you know? Um, because I've seen actual drug acts and other things, you know, being a musician for a few years and some stuff and what people have struggled through. Yeah. Personal responsibility is huge, man. We, we, everything that's going on right now is, is partially due to a lack of empathy and personal responsibility, period. All the language coming out of politics, all the mis, non, mis uh, let's say misinformed nonsense about uh, coronavirus or whatever. Right on both sides or on any sides from out of people's mouths, you know, especially concerning masks or not masks or whatever, you know, all the different ways schools are operating or not. It's ridiculous. It but is. politics is, is built into misinformation and lack of personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. So of course you have to do that because it's always someone else's fault and you create problems you aren't really going to fix because if you fix those problems, then you won't get elected again based on the problem you actually thought up. So there's zero responsibility yeah. Life is all about personal responsibility. You know, you own everything mm -hmm. and you own which you also own the fact that some things are just going to happen and say, all right, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Like you own a house, Mark. I'm like, we moved in here. I had a roof leak, you know, right oh. when I moved in. It's a 50 year wow. roof. It was simply just because a piece of flashing came up on some plumbing pipe on my roof and I got it fixed, but I got really annoyed. And then I was like, what are you going to do? Could have been right. worse, right? Could have been the right. whole roof. Could have blown off. You know, whatever. Yeah. So, um, there's there's so many you can accept it, move through it, or you can just say, well, whatever. I I can't control it. So, but yeah, personal responsibility is so important. It really is. Why do you think we go through hard times? That's what makes us human, man. That's why we're all we're advanced as advanced as we are, mm. because we figure out ways. One, to make our lives easier, but two, to, to uh, we figure out tools to make ourselves stronger in that sense, too, to, to deal with actual hard times. You know, uh, I think it's pretty funny. It's like what we're going through now. We used to tease about like zombie apocalypse and what would you do? And all these people are like, oh, I just get a shotgun and go out and take them all. No, you wouldn't. You would not. You'd cower in your house. Or whatever it is. Right, it's, right. it's like, it's so funny. Like true hard times. People have this crazy concept of what they're going to do when the proverbial S hits the F fan, right? Like if you right, right. say that, what you're going to do is react really quickly unless you plan for it or otherwise. It's like, you know, you can't plan for crazy situations. That's why when you do active shooter training and stuff for schools, we do that Sadova and otherwise it's run mm -hmm. and hide fight. It's not fight, hide, run or fight, fight, fight. Right, right. <laughs> Because you're most likely not prepared unless you're a trained individual, mm -hmm. you know? So that's the big part of it. I, I consider myself relatively aware of what's going on and prepared, but you only prepare so much. You got to live your life too. Sure. You know, there's that. <laughs> but I like to hear people talk about these things. And I think it's just, they say stuff like that to make themselves feel better. Mm -hmm. You know, we all do to a point. Yeah. You talked about it earlier. Um, but at what point, do we need to lean on others or get others, get others involved to help us? Probably more often than I do, mm. to be honest. Um, I don't like asking for help, but uh, I've learned not asking for help is actually pretty selfish sometimes. 
Mm. You know, it really is because wow. you, you're saying you can handle it. And uh, I don't know, cause you can't <laughs> in some cases, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will admit there's, there's times, you know, where I'm just, I'm depressed and I can't function or whatever. Cause something hits me and everybody gets like that. And then I'm just like, well, all these other people have worse problems. You can't live your life like that. Your problems are your problems. Right. You know, and you could be right. empathetic towards other others problems and try to help them, but you can't help anybody if you don't help yourself and you can't help yourself unless you stick your hand out and ask every once in a while. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's why you have friends. That's why you have family. Um, even if you're like me, who is a natural, let's say helper person. I have been since I was little. Yeah. You have to ask for help. You have mm -hmm. to. That's why you have friends. That's, that's family and otherwise it's, you know, and uh, I can tell because I actually start feeling physically sick or overwhelmed when I start getting to a point where I know, all right, I, I'm, I've had too much at this point. There's too much going on mm -hmm. and I know what that feeling is. And then I've got to ask somebody for help. My boss constantly is like, what do you need help with? And she's awesome. Man. Great boss, yeah. Angelica. I'm going to call her out by name here. She'll probably listen to this, but <laughs> I, I'm, I'm blessed with somebody who constantly says that when actually she needs help, because we're all freaking overworked. We're in a rowboat with a bucket throwing water out. Like the whole, every company is kind of like that right now right, because right. we're all strained for resources. We're strained for capital. We're strained for, um, you know, trying to grow in this whatever new environment. Um, yeah. And it's all about helping each other, but also asking for help when you need it. Because if you don't ask for help, you're going to get overwhelmed. And then you can't ask anybody else for help because you're too overwhelmed. That's the way I look at it. I want to shift the conversation a little bit to something a little bit lighter and a little bit more aspirational and inspirational. Um, and just get your thoughts on a few questions about, uh, about success and you know, just kind of general life lessons and things like that, because I always find that interesting in, in the guests that I have. So I wanna start out with this question. What is one secret of your success that you could share with others? Well, it's actually something I kind of learned from you and I would call it extreme scheduling. Because we hear a lot about time management, right? Like college is so focused on time management. We, they have to do uh, SDV classes, which are student development, which is about learning to manage time. That's such nonsense. Like you can't <laughs> manage time. The clock turns. You can stop the clock, but it's still turning. Right. You know, whether you, whether you want it to or not. And you have to schedule things. And I used to make fun of root. I mean, when we were at uh, EDS HP when I worked with with Keith and Mike and all those guys around sitting around me they were older Mike was 60 something Keith was 10 or 11 years older than me they were such creatures of routine and schedule mm. you know they would come in they would have coffee at the same time they would arrive to work at the same time and leave now mind you they didn't have super intense jobs I would say like a, like a high level of management thing where they you know right that wouldn't just wouldn't work because the more you move up, the less your schedule is able to be managed like that. <laughs> but I used to be like, wow, you know, and then I, the older I got, the more I was like, how do I do that? <laughs> how do I build this routine? How, what is a routine? Cause my dad had one, my mom never did. And unfortunately I'm more like my mother. So on that side, and I'm trying to build into this schedule where, there's times blocked off that I'm, I'm not looking at my phone. I'm with my family. I'm, and un, unbridling that from your brain is really hard to do when you lived a certain way your whole life. You know, I've had two jobs for a long time. I've been yeah. trying to do it all, right? Mm -hmm. And you can't, Yeah. you know, and perseverance and patience. And also be nice to people to a fault until you can't anymore. Yeah, I, I like to tell stories too about uh, don't be mean to people in like food service or retail, especially now. Right, you right. Know, because they're being the hardest hit. I remember what it was like to work in those industries and have people be mean to me constantly. And mm -hmm. when I was young, I was just like, man, whatever, stupid people. But again, you as the as the person working there, you have to wonder what that person's going through to act like that <laughs> to right. you for no reason. And I feel like the same when I go through like a drive through line or something if which i don't that often but when i do occasionally and somebody is short or rude or whatever it may have been because the 10 people before them screamed at them about putting a french fry wrong somewhere or giving them the wrong sauce and it's this circle of 
bad karma, yeah. you know, that goes around. And whether you believe in karma or not, it believes in you. So that's the way I look at it. People, people in life, people have, uh, I like what I like to call a God sized hole inside of them, yeah. whether they believe in God or any type of religion and, and you fill it with something right. and you can choose to fill it with positivity or try to, you know, or you can just fill that with a big old negative, you know, or hopelessness or other things. And part one secret, secret to success is scheduling, being nice to people and taking others with you on that journey. Mm -hmm. Whatever success is defined and success for you will over your lifetime will shift, sure. whatever that is. Right now, success for me is, is my career and, and spending as much time with my little girl and my wife as I can, you That's know, awesome. and, and focusing on them. That's awesome. What's the greatest lesson either in life or business that you've ever learned? You know, it's funny. I, I found a quote from <laughs> Van Wilder of all things. I always loved that movie. I don't know why. <laughs> it's pre, pre Ryan Reynolds being everywhere and all that, right, but right. it's a really, really poignant film. If you look at how he lived, even at college, so like super smart, obviously like his dad, he could have been a multimillionaire, you know, just had that magnetic personality. And he had a quote, he's like, don't take life too seriously. You'll never get out alive. And I was like, that's a freaking amazing quote. If you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I am a textbook overthinker, right? I overthink everything. One of the reasons you talk <laughs> about now is, yeah, is I'm aware of very acutely aware of everything that's going on. I understand the academic background of why people think the way they do all these theories that are coming out, all the stuff that everybody's discussing. Do I really need to know all that? to combat it or to have a discussion about it maybe not but again what's to say i just go sit in what i now have is a gigantic backyard and just watch bunnies jump around in the grass you right. know or my neighbor's dog run around or sit and just look at the beautiful mountains i can see or watch the cows walk around a farm you know what watch a train go by do something like that and just enjoy life and mm. sit there and just do that instead of just being in front of a screen. Even if I'm not in front of a screen, I feel like my brain is in front of a screen. Right, right. You know, and have this conversation. Like later today, we have a, a mutual friend of ours coming over to visit, you know, with his yeah. little girl. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping, I mean, he and I have other things to discuss, but <laughs> the, the thing is to focus on our daughters, focus on that friendship, on our families, on... Um, Mm -hmm. on that time together and we will discuss all the crazy things going on yeah but still yeah. it's like again the nowest also or uh, that's not necessarily being present and i need to be right better about that but again i love this don't take life too seriously you'll never get out alive it's so true yeah because all the noise that's like you will pay attention to me right now and it's like right. no i won't i don't need to what do you want from me you want money you want time what do you want pound of flesh whatever it is <laughs> so you know yeah what do you want most for your life peace my friend peace mm. i uh could use some peace we all could use some peace and grace yeah all this cancel culture nonsense we hear about is due to a lack of grace and peace mm. and i'm not even talking about that in the, the religious sense it's where it originates from but um it was a phrase I heard up, I grew up hearing Catholic, you know, I grew up Catholic was peace be upon you. Right. Yeah. Cool. And if we sat and we said that to each other, if we did the whole shake your hands and say, peace be upon you with other people, you know, maybe we mm. use hand sanitizer first now or whatever is going on. <laughs> right, right. But I mean, I don't remember yeah. what peace felt like, you know, and I, I'm, 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 for, I'm forcing myself into a, a box where I figure out what that is again. Because yeah. I remember, you know, it's just it's been, you're, when you're so embroiled in stuff that's negative, you're, you've got to find peace somewhere, yeah. you know, because if you can, again, you can't center yourself and you end up in the same spiral you're in and you can't attack your problems like you would normally because you're just so overwhelmed. You just get to the point where you're like, all right, I'm going to do something. And then you're like, <gasps> and you just freeze. Right. But peace right. and grace. I, I'm just at the point in my life where I'm in a fervent search for peace, whatever that means. And if that ends up being a religious thing, fine. I don't know. Or if it ends up being something else. And that's why I commend everybody. It's like um, people that say they are 
uh, like anti-religious or atheist or whatever. I'm like, cool, good for you. I thought I was that at one point, but that's more just you not liking a certain religion or somebody because they don't. And if, and if somebody's religious or whatever they believe in uh, gives them peace and they are able to project grace because yeah. of that, then good for them. They're living yeah. the life they need to lead. You know, that's the way I look at it. Whatever gets you to that point in your life, that you're able to to feel the comfort that you know allows you to be graceful to other people and then have peace in your life. Um, I envy you, and I am I want to know what that secret is. <laughs> you know, if you could give one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? Um, I have built entire friendships with one simple commonality with somebody. Mm -hmm. Entire friendships. We could disagree on everything else, down to color of shirt, politics. It doesn't matter what it is. You can take that commonality and build an entire lifelong friendship on that. Mm. And I cannot believe that, I, I refuse to believe that people can't take that to heart nowadays and take all this strife and disagreement and negativity that's actually being manufactured by those in power, to be honest, mm. and get back to this, all right, you and I can be friends. What's something you're into? I ask my students this all. It's like, what are you into? You know? Right, right. I, I can relate to you on almost anything because I like a lot of different things. You know, mm -hmm. we can talk about video games. We can talk about history. We can talk about television shows. We can talk about, I don't know. I'm interested in, like you said, gardening. I'm, I'm not handy. I'm learning, but yeah, I want to yeah. hear all about it. I love, I know what, I love that I know what a, uh, a frame step is now because I've had to deal with all sorts of window stuff and things like yeah, that. And yeah. just these technical carpenter gibberish terms and stuff. So, but I built friendships just on discussions around those things, just being interested in what somebody else is saying. Because mm. even if you're not interested at first, you listen. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, uh, my daughter's gotten to the age where she'll be watching something on YouTube kids or whatever. And she'll be like, daddy, daddy, what's, you know, do you know what this, this person is doing that? And I, and I, I will stop what I'm doing and I will sit down and, and ask her questions and listen. Cause I remember how I felt when I was little, when I was excited about something and my parents ignored me or didn't get it. Or cause mm. you know, my dad was of a very different generation. Even if I don't care at first what she's talking about, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to intently listen and ask questions about it. Cause I love her that much, you know, and you should be like, be able to love somebody else as a human to be able to find that commonality and build on it. You know, that's the advice I would give because I, like I said, just a simple connection, a simple spark builds into like massive friendships. Mm -hmm. And one of the best examples too is Antonin Scalia and Ruth Ginsburg. Mm. They were very obviously vastly different politically, but they respected each other. They were friends, you know, for their most of, you know, the time they were on the bench or whatever it is, probably even before then, because they were both intellectuals and they both respected that, but they're just, Hey, you're a person and I can hang out with you and mm. disagree about everything, whatever. But all, when you boil it down, we're still people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's the way I look at the stuff. I try to at least. Mm. How do you want to go about leaving the world better than you found it? I like that question because you asked that of my classes and stuff. But I think I'm working on it now, honestly. Just mm -hmm. helping as many people as possible in the best way I can. Mm -hmm. which is, you know, right now it's career stuff. And otherwise it's what I know and imparting years of experience and just <laughs> like you said, pain and suffering onto people. So they don't have to deal with it or they, or telling them that they will have to deal with it and it's okay. Mm -hmm. You'll get through it. Cause I have so many students right now being like, Oh, I sent out 30 applications and I haven't heard anything. And I'm like, better send out 30 more. 100 more 200 more i don't care that's the suffering part is looking for a job is is suffering it is it's a job and i mean that's that's my thing is just i was put if there's a god i was put on this earth to help others mm -hmm. that's my that's my purpose i figured out my purpose uh let's say 10 years ago yeah right that I, that I was really, this is, this is my superpower is I have this ability to, to be able to help people, whatever that is. You, do. you know, I just need to translate that better to myself, but 
it makes me feel good and that's not, but that's not why I do it. It's because it needs to be done. Mm. You know, I feel like it does. There are so many people uh, in the age group that we, you know, that we deal with, with college kids that are just lost because they're told that, oh, you know, they can't ever afford a house. They'll never pay off their student loans. They'll, they'll be stuck in some job they hate their whole life. And that's not true. It's right. not. Right. Correct. And we have to open, I have to like show them, hey, if you want to pursue a finance degree because you want to work in finance, fine, but you can also just get a business degree or, you, you know, there's lots of avenues to get to the same point you want to get to. And that point you want to get to is not where you're going to end up, mm -hmm. most likely. It might be, you know, depending on how focused you are, but you and I both know, you know, you sang on a cruise ship at one point. I was a high school teacher. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I worked at Dollar Tree for God's sake and all these other different places just yeah. trying to figure out what I was doing and it's you know I was put here to help people and that's yeah. that's how I do it uh, and I also obviously that little girl that I'm raising is is how I leave the world better than I can is because she's mm -hmm. a better person than me mm -hmm. and I have to make sure yeah. she stays that way and does not get turn into a cynical old person who hates everything in some cases mm. and ends up finding joy and peace and grace in life. Yeah. Amen to that. So at this point, I want to open it up for you to share any final thoughts with us. Is there, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you think would be helpful for us to know? If you find something in life that actually makes you happy, like truly happy, yeah. not chemically happy, or otherwise, you know, <laughs> things like that. Right. You need to dig further into what that is. Mm -hmm. There's all these like misconceptions too. It's like, oh, you can do what you love and make the amount of money. Not always, you know, but you can, you can do a job and still on the side or, or find a way to do what you love, or at least you, maybe you need to build a business to do that. Maybe you need to take some other avenue. Um, but yeah, I mean, don't, don't let people put you in a little box as far as where you should be going. Because we had Mark and I's parents came from the silent generation and the boomers and they were all just put on. A, I feel like somebody wound them up and just pushed them down a path. You know, luckily, I mean, your dad was an entrepreneur and your mom, they didn't take that path necessarily because I, I feel like I feel like leaving their home country has a lot to do with it. You know, in your case, like taking a huge risk and a chance. And that's not the norm for that generation. Absolutely. You know, at least at least American generation. Yeah, you're I would kidding. say. Yep. Um, my grandma, I don't know, took that chance, you know, coming here from the Philippines or whatever, but I don't know that she was given a choice there either, but, mm -hmm. um, it's like take it, you have to take some calculated risk. And I feel like we've just pushed that right out the window because, oh God, risk, you wear 12 masks and you go outside, then there's no risk of you getting anything. And it's like, what the, come on, right. you know, <laughs> Right. Just like go out in a Darth Vader helmet. Don't worry, you won't get COVID anymore. You might just, you know, look like an idiot and not be able to breathe <laughs> or whatever right, it is. Right. <laughs> but there's, there is, there are calculated risks in life. Lord. And every decision is that, you know, it's like, also, it's like looking at things like trade-offs and oper personal opportunity costs. I do this all day long where I'm like, all right. I've got some time when I'm not working or I'm not doing things. What do I do with that time? Is it going to be, is that efficient or am I just leaning down the dopamine side of my brain and that's what I'm going to do? And every once in a while you need a dopamine injection in your brain. You yeah. Do, yeah. Whatever that is, you know. So, but yeah, I mean, uh, and try to focus on the positive. Mm. Even in the most negative of negative situations, one of the most horrible but poignant thoughts I guess I've had right now yeah. is. I hate to say it with my mother, but I'm kind of glad she passed away this year, last year and not this year because oh gosh, this would have been a horrible experience. One from a anxiety perspective of her and plus the, the fact that, you know, COVID would have targeted her definitely even worse. It's like some form of grace was given yeah. in that sense. Yeah. And it sucks because I miss my mother obviously very much and, and, I had Claire the other day being like, well, I don't necessarily, I don't want to be a lady when I'm older because grandma was a lady and she died. And I'm like, mm. oh God, Claire, don't think of, don't think of things. That's okay. You know, grandma was yeah. old and she was sick and, you know, but you, you have to find the positive. I was like, the positive is she's, she's at rest. She's yeah. not upset. She's not sick anymore, you know? Mm. So 
uh, we need to, it's like if I could find a social media account that is nothing but like positive thoughts, but poignant positive thoughts, I would just look at that right. instead of uh, all the sniping and the, you know, everything else that's going on. Yeah, that's true. So where can people find you and connect with you online? I just look, easiest thing is just Google me and go to LinkedIn, mm -hmm. you know. I, um, I'm i happy to, for people to contact me on LinkedIn yeah. and then we can exchange personal information from there on. Um, I have a very unique name. It's really easy to find me, <laughs> to yeah. be honest. Unfortunately, you know, I'm not Muhammad and I'm not Bob. So, you <laughs> right. know, you find me pretty easily. Right, right. <laughs> Miles, thank you so much. This has been an amazing interview, actually. There Happy is, to do it. There is such gold in, in the things that you shared so much, not just about, not just about suffering but, and, and getting through tough times, but also just the, the, your perspective on life and your perspective on, on what you want on you know how we need to be with other people i mean it's all it's all tied and, and connected with each other and and I, I really appreciate you taking time to share some of those thoughts with us today thank you sure it's all aspirational in many senses but that's how life is you aspire to be these things and you may aspire your whole life but at least you're aspiring towards positivity and not negativity and uh, lifting others up versus tearing others down so that's that's how you have to work or how you have to live and work towards. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.